Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I am the founder of Humanist Learning Systems, who is the education partner for this program. I am also the vice president of the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association. And I want to welcome you to this month's Lunch and Learn. My guest, my, uh, my co-host, my co-host is Elizabeth Castillo. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. So nice to see you here today. Um, I'm Elizabeth in at Arizona State University. I teach organizational leadership um, here, and we're just really pleased to have you. Thank you. And oh, I'm secretary of the Humanistic um, Management Association. Great. Our guest today is Dr. Gary Redfeather. He has spent the last 30 years working as a clinician researcher a holistic wellness practitioner and educator linking how individual physiological and psychological health underlie and parallel the vitality of organizations. His educational and professional experiences weave together neuroscience and neuroplasticity, philosophy, positive psychology, and mind-body practices like yoga and meditation with strategic and future-based scenario planning, cross-cultural team management, subconscious bias, and post-traumatic growth. He develops individual group and or uh, organizational programs that develop the leader within that serve as the foundational catalyst to change the systems in which leaders and employees operate. Uh, he's been instrumental behind expanding the national leadership training program for the nonprofit organization, Pharmacy Leadership and Educational Institute since the mid 1990s, creating and facilitating programs for organizations like the American Pharmacy Association, the California Pharmacists Association and multiple universities and professionals organizations. Uh, so welcome, Gary, and thank you for joining us today. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here from Nottingham, England. And so Yay. very pleased to, to, to be rounding out my week Friday afternoon with you. So thank you, Jennifer. Perfect. Well, the topic today um, is humanistic medical education and care with the idea of re-engineering minds and systems one person at a time. So we're very excited for you to talk to us a little bit about your experience with humanistic leadership in the medical setting and take it away. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. And so so I really appreciate everyone tapping in today. What I'd like to do in the in the first part of this is is to just really discuss three major themes, if you will, around the the broad topic of of, of medicine, of health and healthcare, and and really how we're at an inflection point in in time where we're either going to establish our practices to really help us for for the future or we're going to kind of wallow in our own success and I'll, I'll explain what that means in just a little bit but the three things the three themes that i would like to start uh to do start the discussion if you will really has to do with the first one is leadership cannot be taught okay so I know a couple of us are educators and, and we're really into leadership and, and leader development. And most of us who have been in the area have come to realize that like health, it cannot be forced on anyone. And so leadership actually cannot be taught. We can provide information and structures and help people understand things from a real um, book smart sort of way, but leadership itself has to be learned. Okay, it's like health actually has to be lived by the individual, not by the healthcare practitioner. And so me as a pharmacist or somebody who's a, who's a physician, we can again provide a, a safe space for somebody. We can provide them with lots of information, but in the end, it's up to them to actually step into their own life, if you will. But what we do as educators, what we do as clinicians, is either to help them step into that space or prevent them from stepping into that space in a way that's really helping helping them long term. For example, I can give you a prescription that will quote unquote cure your blood pressure or your diabetes, but if you continue to drink and smoke and eat poorly and not exercise, I'm actually not helping you in the long term. And so so this theme around things cannot be taught, they must be learned really does kind of come with that caveat that we as educators and we as healthcare practitioners can either really help cultivate and facilitate somebody's self-empowerment, or we can kind of strip them of that. Okay, so that's the first thing that I would, um, would talk about. And now the key thing here that kind of leads into the second theme is 
I bet you may be offended if I tell every one of you, you're agnostic and you don't even know it. Okay, that's a joke, by the way. <laughs> but what that means is the brain is absolutely unknowing what you are asking it to do. And so if we ask our body, our brain, our organizations to do something, it's they're all designed to just simply comply. And so they don't really differentiate. So our brain especially doesn't differentiate between good behaviors or bad behaviors. It just simply, and I'm sorry, I think my uh, my video locked up. Hold on just a second. Um, I'll keep talking, but um, what happens is when we when we just simply ask the system to do something, it does it. And it doesn't really differentiate if it's good or bad. What we do is we differentiate what is good or bad, not the system itself, if that makes sense. So now let me restart my video and hopefully I'll come back. I'm, I'm back. Um, so so what we what that does for us is it helps us to realize that some of the things that we have may have learned in the past may have been taught to us by very well intending people but we're misguided and so the key thing about leadership being learned or anything else being learned is we can actually learn things the wrong way the system doesn't know about that people around us may think that they're helping us out in the best ways but in reality they might not okay so the way we learn is just as important as recognizing that we are the ones who need to learn okay now when you think about this we never really truly forget anything that we've learned in the past i know, I know most of us are probably at the age where we go that's definitely not true i definitely forgot a lot <laughs> and you go well not really because the system is beautifully designed to to really remember the things that are important and once the neuronal pathways get changed based on that learning those pathways never really go away. And so key to this is when we learn something the wrong way, those pathways are laid down pretty much for good. What we then do is we spend a tremendous amount more energy trying to unlearn the past learning while we're still trying to operate in a way that helps us out versus if we just would have learned it the proper way in the first time. <laughs> so again, this is another theme that kind of bolts on to that second one. And that leads us to just simply kind of make a more broad statement is the human brain is actually very, very well designed at doing certain things. And it's not designed to do very well other things. We commonly don't ask it to do the things that it does really well. And in this modern life, we're trying to pressure it to do what it really doesn't. And Part of what uh, we're in some of the questions of, uh, I think that were submitted early is has to do with burnout. Well, burnout actually has a tremendous amount to do with us trying to pressure our internal and supportive systems around us to do things that they are not designed to do. That burnout is actually a, a, a expected outcome of some of that mismatch, if you will. And so again, when we start to consider these types of things, we can start to then say, well, what, what, what really does help us out then? So what would we need to change to actually create a better future for us? And the first thing is to just simply recognize that we created all of these systems, okay? We have had and still continue to have a very active role in everything that we see. Matter of fact, the results that we are seeing in the world right now were pretty much designed by us and nature. And so the results that we are seeing on a global uh, 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 scale, you know, like like climate change, like the even the pandemic and the response to the pandemic, uh, geopolitical forces and all of that, were designed by us collectively, not one of us, not just a few of us, but collectively, we all designed this. And if we don't like the current results, which I think most people would say we don't like a lot of the results in the world right now, we just go, okay, if we designed it, we can redesign it. We can actually take what is working, keep it while we retool the system to create something that's better. 
Now there's a key thing to all of this that has to do with that learning and unlearning that I mentioned before is that in my own, in my own research and in my own clinical practice uh, in chronic pain, we know that most people start with lives of thriving. You know, so you're a little kid, you can conquer the world type of thing. Little, a whole bunch of little things or a big trauma happens that then causes your system to really change. Okay, so you basically go from a pre-traumatic state, if you will, to a post-traumatic state, but that happens completely naturally. You don't have to do anything except for live to go from a pre-traumatic state to a post-traumatic state, okay? Now, the question then is, if we go from this to this naturally without anything, could we actually take ourselves from this back, back to a state of thriving, okay? And the answer is no, we cannot. We cannot go from this back to that because we can't unlearn everything. We can't undo that physiology. But what we can do is we can go from this pre-trauma to this post-trauma to something different. That's not in question. And so anyone who has gone through a trauma, who is experiencing pain, whatever it is, should know that we absolutely can go from that state of non-thriving to a state of better thriving. Now, how that has to do with medical leadership and medical practices is really based around the fact that the systems were designed 20, 30, 40, 80 years ago to capitalize on the scientific and technical advances that were happening that we thought were going to save us in the end. Now, I'm not saying any of those scientific and technical advances are not helping. But what we did do, I think, is we went from states of community where we had very close connections with one another to becoming completely isolated in a hyper-connected world with our phones and the internet. And now we're seeing the results of that hyper-connectivity but completely disconnected type of lifestyle, okay? What we can do is use those exact same types of technologies to do what they do well which will allow us to do what we do well. And that means let the scientific and technical advances do things like diagnose a disease. Okay, so in my own world, in, in healthcare, part of the things that I teach my students and we, we, we encourage other, um, others to kind of look at is there is no one physician who can keep up with all of the literature that accumulates on a daily basis in a single field of medicine, let alone all of the advances that are happening. So if, if it's technically and not physically possible for one person to keep up on all the advances, why are we asking them to do that? Why don't we ask a machine with AI and learning, you know, machine learning to compile different types of understandings on rapid timeframes that we cannot even closely approach, which then allows us to actually have time to spend with people. To go back to the medicine that we used to practice 100, 200, 300, 2000 years ago, because medicine basically was born out of connection. Sitting with somebody, letting them cry on your shoulder, holding their hand, and then exploring what could be done together as a community. We lost that in the last hundred years, but we're at an inflection point where we can start to bring this back in. And so entities like Watson, like IBM's Watson or Deep Blue, these are, these are scientific and technical advances that will allow healthcare to be transformed where machines and machine learning take over what they do really well which is basically compile information, sift through data, run the statistics, you know, come up with possible things that can happen. And that allows the healthcare practitioners like me and others to finally go back to the people and sit with them in humanistic ways, really connect with them because that's what people crave. That's what people miss. And I'll just end my, my comments here by, by saying something a little bit controversial. And that is, I do not believe there is an opioid crisis. And this may catch some of you off guard, which I hope it does. But let me explain what I mean by this, okay? I'm not saying that there's not a problem out there where 
hundreds of thousands of people are unfortunately overdosing globally, okay? But that's not a crisis of an opioid. I'm an opioid pharmacologist and it's been studying them for about 30 years and I can tell you the opioid is fine. The opioid actually is a wonderful medication because it provides people with one of two things, relief from the pains that they cannot get relief from any other way, and a euphoria or a good feeling that they cannot get in their life because of all of the other things happening. So the opioid is fine. So what's driving the issues today is a, and is a crisis is a loss of connection. It's a loss of hope. It's a loss of community. If we really want to address healthcare disparities and all the, you know, most of the problems that we have in, in the world today, especially from a medical standpoint, we would start to reconnect with one another on a very humanistic level. Yes, we need to address the other parts of this, so it's not at the exclusion of the other parts, but it's let's get back to holding each other's hands. Let's get back to really listening to one another. Let's get back to what really we were designed to do 200,000 years ago, and that's sit around the campfire, eat together, sing together, and dance. So those are my thoughts about re-engineering and reinventing health and healthcare. Uh, and I thought that would be just a good segue into uh, a, a longer discussion, if you will, so. I love it. And I'm reminded of my first conversation with you and how much I love just like, I could talk to you for hours about these things because there's so many places we can go with this, right?